Hi, Dr. Dicek. Uh, hope everybody is well. It is Wednesday. Uh, wanted to check in with you guys. There's so much to talk about. We're going to have to break this up into a few posts, but it's really gratifying. I have to tell you the um, the educational forum that's been created here and in other places on COVID and even other healthcare related issues as a result of the pandemic. People have taken a keen interest in science and learning so much about the human immune system and virology. The average person now knows more than most doctors knew one year ago uh, about certain issues and illnesses. Um, but I, I, you know, what's gratifying about this forum, because I received a bunch of emails this morning uh, in reference to this. As you know, many of the times we've discussed issues well before they were published in the media. Uh, and I feel that the people who are participatory in this forum um, are actually more updated because we talk openly and debate these issues sometimes before they become media hype. And one of the huge reports that came out actually uh, just several days ago in a preprint in the study Science, um, actually not a preprint, it's actually published at this point, uh, is a study out of La, the La Jolla Center for Infectious Disease and Vaccine Research. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because we actually discussed this exact issue two and a half months ago on this forum, uh, but yet it's reaching now, This uh, the release of the study came out, and I mentioned it actually uh, in the early stages when I had spoken to one of my colleagues who was involved in specific research related to the issue that we're about to discuss. So in the uh, journal Science uh, put out on August 4th, uh, they, what they did is they reported uh, about a specific group of individuals where they were able to get blood samples on individuals who uh, were, they had blood from pre-pandemic uh, period. In other words, they collected blood samples in 2019 before coronavirus or COVID-19 existed here in the U.S. and they had these stored blood samples and what they did is uh, they were looking for uh, reactivity or T-cell antibodies or T-cell memory cells present uh, in those blood samples to COVID-19. Uh, so basically, they wanted to see if people had some sort of existing antibody or immune response prior to the pandemic. Why would that be? Why would individuals here in the United States have evidence of cross-reactivity to COVID-19 virus before the pandemic ever hit here in the United States? And the answer is, uh, as we've discussed on this forum many times, previous coronavirus infections. Remember, there are four common coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Uh, we've spoken about them on this forum before, and we've spoken about the fact that individuals uh, like parents or pediatricians or nurses who are around children, for instance, who get many, many colds throughout the year, that those individuals might in fact have more natural immunity based on cross-reactivity with those four cousins of COVID-19 or uh, the coronavirus uh, common cold viruses. Uh, so they looked at blood samples on a number of individuals. Um, they looked at these areas uh, called T-cell epitopes, which are uh, areas uh, where the T-cell responds to the specific viruses. Uh, and they looked at over 140 of these epitopes on T cells of these individuals. And what they found is that 20 to 50% of individuals tested had what, what they called cross reactivity with those 142 isotopes. It means that 20 to 50% of the sample in, of the studied individuals had some evidence of previous uh, immune activity against viruses similar to COVID-19, but not actually COVID-19. And this might be offering them some T-cell memory immunity. Uh, where do those T-cells come from? We've spoken about it before. They come from the thymus gland in the human. Uh, and the now these are different than the IgG antibodies that everybody is running around to get measured. Remember, IgG antibodies peak at about 21 days, and then they typically wane by about 80, 90 days. That's what we've seen in many mildly sick or moderately sick patients. But these antibodies are the second line of defense. They're called T-cell antibodies, or T, and those are the CD4 and CD8 cells that we've discussed in the past. And these are memory cells which stick around and have more uh, neutralizing activity against the virus. 
What the study could not answer is how long these T cells actually last, whether they give short-term or long-term immunity. This is strictly a hypothesis at this point. It's not a proven uh, entity, but it's an important hypothesis which will now be studied fur further. So the summary is that uh, in this study out of La Jolla, a very important study published in Science, that individuals who were exposed to previous non-serious forms of coronavirus, like the common cold coronavirus is the four subtypes, that they might actually have some cross-reactivity via their T cell responses uh, to COVID-19. And this might explain why some individuals get critically ill and some don't get ill at all, or maybe asymptomatic, because individuals who've had a lot of exposure to the common cold coronaviruses might have some built-in protection. That's the hypothesis. It's not a reason to celebrate. It's not a reason to take off your masks. It's not a reason to assume you'll never get infected. It's simply one of the many hypotheses that are floating around right now. And it's important uh, study. And I think what's most important on this forum is we've discussed this over two and a half months ago. And right now we're seeing the fruits of that research. On the vaccine front, uh, very interesting. The Russians, as you know, released a vaccine prior to complete phase three studies. It's a pretty shocking um, uh, piece of information because it is absolutely inappropriate for the Russians to release any vaccine for use in uh, human beings without it being studied in proper safety and efficacy trials. It's not considered scientific standard. I don't know anybody who would take one of these vaccines uh, from the Russian um, uh, uh, studies at this point. Uh, quite frankly, they're using it as a geopolitical tool right now to be able uh, to gain favor with certain countries where they can distribute this vaccine, uh, probably for fairly low cost. So it, this is really a potentially very dangerous thing for the Russians to do. It's dangerous to release a poorly studied vaccine. It's dangerous for the population to assume they're immune. And it's also dangerous because it'll take away the public confidence in vaccines when we see that it might turn out to be a failure. So it, it's thumbs down on the Russian vaccine release at this point. And it's really very, very serious. And, and from a scientific perspective, it's a very serious violation. Um, we're gonna discuss in the following days some more information about the type of tests available for COVID-19, but we've been the physicians have been fairly alarmed by some recent behavior, not only by certain physicians, but by patients. Um, I want to clarify a couple of things. The, there are two basic ways to currently diagnose COVID-19. Uh, one is through the antigen test, which is the test that we're using in my office primarily when we do it here in the office. That test has a 99.8 to 99.9 .9 specificity. It means that when it's positive, it is correct 99.8% of the time. It's not cross-reacting with other viruses that are non-COVID-19. Unfortunately, it has a published uh, uh, 12 to 15, uh, I'm sorry, 15 to 18% false negative rate, which means you can miss a, a patient who has COVID-19 about 15% of the time, maybe even more. Uh, and it, that's the limitation of the test. Uh, but it's a very good test and it's been very helpful. Uh, the PCR test, uh, the, the, which is a molecular test, uh, which detects the RNA, the antigen test detects the protein, the molecular test, the PCR detects the RNA uh, of the virus. Uh, that one has uh, about anywhere from a 2 to a 37% false negative rate, uh, depending on which platform they're using the lab. Uh, and false positives is uh, somewhere around 5%. Why would there be a false positive in a PCR? Uh, because PCR also detects dead virus. So if somebody had the virus six, seven, eight, nine weeks ago, we might still be detecting live virus. Uh, false positives in the antigen test is extremely rare. The reason it blew up is because the governor of Ohio recently in a screen to see uh, uh, President Trump was detected on an antigen test, which the White House uses uh, as a positive. The governor then went and got tested by PCR. It was negative, and the media assumed it was a false positive. It could have been one of the ultra-rare false positives. We don't know. The point is, people should not be getting tested, discovered to be positive, and then running around to find a negative result, because it's very easy to find a negative result once you've tested positive. And the reason is uh, the virus is very hard to detect. Yes, uh, two days ago in my office, we had a gentleman here who was sick. He had 
sore throat, he had myalgias, he had cough, uh, he was feeling very weak, fatigued. He clearly had a viral illness. My uh, medical assistant swabbed him in the morning. He was negative on our antigen test. I was not comfortable with that because he looked sicker. Uh, so I called him back, re-swabbed him at five in the afternoon, uh, and sure enough, he was positive. Uh, we did find it on a second antigen test. Now, if we go, that was a very fortuitous finding because he was now able to isolate himself and to inform his family and his contacts that he was now positive. People are running around looking for negatives after positives so they don't have to quarantine, so they don't have to isolate. Uh, it's inappropriate. Um, it's inappropriate for physicians to guide them in that way because quite frankly, uh, if we're going to debate every one of these and rely on false negatives, which are much more common, remember the false negatives in the PCR are 2 to 37% of the time, the false negatives in the antigen test are extremely, uh, are, I'm sorry, uh, 15 to 18%. So that's a very high false negative rate. And I would advise everybody and remind them that during peak COVID here in New York, we had critically ill patients in the hospital who tested repeatedly PCR negative during the initial phases of their illness until we finally were able to recover virus. Some of them were tested six, seven, or eight times until we were able to recover virus. Uh, but we knew they had COVID because they were critically ill and had all the other findings of COVID. So we can't rely on false negatives for PCRs or antigen testing. If you're positive, you're assumed to be infectious and should be treated as such. Uh, it's that simple. Otherwise, we're going to harm somebody that we love potentially or somebody that we don't know. So I'm going to leave it at that for today. Um, uh, we'll meet again hopefully tomorrow or the next day, but I want to thank everybody for tuning in and please continue to you know send in your messages and your debates and uh, clearly we're open to all suggestions when they're appropriate and, and uh, not vulgar and certainly no personal attacks on anybody who comments on these forums. That's inappropriate. Have a great day. Take care.